Studies and Research Center. My name is Kevin Gaines and I'm the director of the ASRC and it's my pleasure to serve as the moderator for uh, this event, our panel today, Wakanda Forever, a critical conversation about the Black Panther movement. So a brief word about the genesis of this event, uh, a little preview of, of, of part of my presentation. Uh, having noticed the enormous attention that the Black Panther movie was, was uh, getting all across uh, the media, generating vast amounts of critical commentary, uh, I thought we at the ASRC should have a public conversation, have an event uh, to uh, talk about the film and take part in this ongoing discussion. And as soon as I had that thought, I got a call from Russell Rickford, my colleague, uh, who had practically the same idea. Uh, and so, uh, Russell reached out to me and uh, after some sketching, here we are today. So, <clears throat> How often has it been that a film that centrally deals with representations of African power and with issues of the relationship between African Americans and Africans has been a critically acclaimed and uh, commercial blockbuster? So this is a conversation that, that we have been looking forward to and uh, I hope that you will join us in the conversation. We want to make uh, relatively brief presentations and then turn it over to the public uh, for your reactions and for your uh, uh, thoughts about the film. And at this time, I'd like to thank the staff of the ASRC, uh, Treva Levine, Renee Milligan, and Donna Panisi, who did all kinds of uh, uh, scheduling, uh, uh, troubleshooting, and logistics to make this event happen. And so we're grateful for their support. So we're calling this event a critical conversation. And some may think that that's odd given that, you know, we're only talking about a work of mass entertainment. But as I think most of you know, this movie is generating enthusiastic uh, raves and commentary, <clears throat> impassioned and serious responses from many critics and viewers from many parts of the black world. So it's really interesting when we think about the reception of the film to talk about it's how it's being re uh, received, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And we can be entertained by the film while taking stock of the fact that it's a complicated and contradictory work of popular culture. And in this case, one that happens to be produced and distributed by a multinational corporation the Disney Company, with its own history of problematic and stereotypical representations of African Americans and people of color. So as an inherently contradictory mass market film, there are going to be aspects of the film that we like, and there are going to be aspects of the film that are troubling. So accordingly, audiences of African descent have had widely varying and complex reactions to the film. Many have found it inspiring. Others have found it politically problematic. The film has certainly proved to be a catalyst for spirited and serious reflection on issues of African and Afro-diasporic <coughs> cultural identity. <clears throat> and it's tapped into serious ethical questions, discussions of ethical questions, on the popular representation of the black image and how we, as black and <coughs> African peoples, have related to each other. Today we have uh, three panelists, my fellow panelists, who will speak briefly about the film uh, and they will cover a, ver a variety of perspectives. I suspect there may be some overlap uh, between our points of view. And then we'll open the conversation to you all and we're very keen on hearing your thoughts and impressions of the film. So I'll introduce the speakers in the order that they'll present. First, Professor Indri Asie Lumumba is a member of the ASRC faculty, and her expertise includes the areas of African education and African women's leadership and feminism. Second, Russell Redford is a member of the history department 
and his areas of expertise include the black radical tradition and African American history. So before Professor Asi Lumumba and Professor Rickford share their thoughts on the film, I wanted to begin by raising some historical issues that the film engages with. Um, and maybe you, you've seen this in the, in the coverage of the film, maybe not. Uh, but I, I feel it's really important to talk about actual sort of real world historical dynamics. This is a film of, uh, I guess it's, well, it's based on a comic, so it's an imaginative film. Uh, some have called it an Afrofuturistic fantasy. But it's not completely new. It's not completely novel. Obviously, the creators of the Black Panther comic book and this film are making recourse to actual historical events. And so I just wanted to talk a little bit uh, about that as a way, in case you're not <coughs> prone to think about popular entertainment in a sort of a, 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 sort of a larger historical context, uh, that that might be useful. So because African and African American history are not often at the center of public conversation in our society, um, we would lose, I think we may lose sight of the historical precedence for some of the, uh, the aspects of the film that we find so thrilling. So I want to talk about three, only three aspects. There's, there's definitely a lot more that could be said about it, but three main themes that the film sort of suggested to me uh, as uh, uh, significant historical themes that we might uh, think about. One is African women warriors and black women, the, the role of black women in historical freedom struggles. The second is African national sovereignty as a beacon and an inspiration to black and African people everywhere. And of course, you know, uh, this is a counterpart to the sort of the, the role that Wakanda plays in the Black Panther movie as uh, this sort of fantasy of African uh, power and technological progress. And the third theme I want to talk about, and I suspect that, that uh, my fellow presenters will have a lot to say about, is the historical relationship of African Americans and African peoples. Or another way to put that would be Pan-African solidarity. So I want to begin with this first theme about African women warriors, sort of defined broadly with uh, just a, a, a brief discussion of, uh, of Queen Nzinga of Angola. And she uh, was a, a female ruler. Her, she was born into a royal family, and her brother was going to inherit the throne, but uh, her brother died, and so she ascended to the throne. Um, she was a very notable female ruler. 17th century, and when you think of female rulers, and it's very uncommon, obviously, for women to be heads of state, but we, we tend to think of Queen Elizabeth I, uh, who, who's a contemporary, or maybe we think of Catherine the Great, but Queen Zinga is uh, a very notable figure who doesn't get much uh, discussion, and I just, uh, this is a new book about her by the historian and scholar uh, Linda <coughs> Uh, and so there's this new biography of her, which is you know a very sort of acclaimed political work. And the illustration of Queen Zinga here you see her uh, with uh, her weaponry bow and arrow. Uh, Queen Zinga was notable for her military prowess as a military leader, uh, as well as her political skill to uh, to to be a woman and conquer uh, both Portuguese invaders at that time, and their African allies was uh, no mean feat. And so she's a significant <clears throat> figure in African history for you know, being one of these uh, uh, extraordinary figures, also skilled in, in diplomacy as well. Queen Nzinga was the ruler of part of the Congo Kingdom in what is present day Angola. And uh, at the peak of her rule, uh, she ruled the area of Ndobo, but also at the peak of her rule had conquered the region of Matanda as well. 
And here's another illustration of her in uh, the 1960s. These <coughs> pictures uh, were painted by an Italian artist who was working alongside Portuguese evangelical uh, missions to uh, the, that, that region of, of Africa. <coughs> So another example of the African woman warrior is Queen Nomi of the Maroons. And she was the leader of the uh, Maroon community in Jamaica uh, during the, the 17th and 18th century called Nanny Town. And Maroons, of course, were enslaved peoples in the Caribbean, but also well, in the Americas, who had escaped from the plantations and formed <coughs> independent settlements. Uh, self-sufficient settlements. And Nanny had been an escaped uh, enslaved person who had been shipped from West Africa and most scholars believe that she had been taken from the Ashanti region of what is uh, today Ghana. So the Maroon settlement that Nanny led in uh, Jamaica was in the mountains away from European settlement and was quite successful for a time uh, Nanny raided plantations, uh, made uh, numerous successful raids to free slaves held on plantations. And this is what Maroon societies did. Maroon societies were trying to sort of increase the zone of freedom within the context of plantation societies in the Caribbean. And so uh, scholars uh, the consensus among scholars is that her efforts contributed to the escape of almost a thousand slaves over her lifetime. So of course, with uh, the uh, crops and property of the plantation owners being damaged by the maroons, uh, the British colonial authorities became embarrassed and threatened by the success of Nanny in Nanny Town and the maroons, and so plantation owners who were losing slaves and equipment sent British forces to uh, subdue and uh, uh, destroy the community. And Nanny was killed by British uh, forces along with uh, free black missionary, uh, I'm sorry, mercenaries in 1733. And eventually, uh, Nanny's brother, Kudjo, negotiated a settlement with the British to um, establish a separate uh, society, a separate community. So now moving on to the question of African national sovereignty. African Americans have had their struggles for equality in the United States, but they've always viewed those struggles for freedom within the context of the worldwide struggles for freedom of African people. And African Americans, at practically the nadir of their situation in the United States, were thrilled to receive news coverage of the defeat of an invading Italian army, thousands of, of, of Italian troops, in Ethiopia by the Emperor Menelik and uh, the Empress in the Battle of Adwa. And it just so happens that today is the anniversary of the Battle of Adwa, which took place <coughs> March 1st, 1896. If you go back and look at the African American press, African Americans, civil society, there are black owned newspapers in most major urban areas, and they're celebrating the victory of Emperor Menelik over the Italian forces. And um, this was a rallying point in Ethiopian history. This illustration is part of a number of paintings in a, a sort of a style of Ethiopian art. Uh, paintings that were done by artists from Ethiopia during the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and this was done around the 1970s. And it, it is a, a big panoramic scene of the Battle of Adwa. And you have Emperor Menelik in the center. Uh, you have Empress Taiwa out there. And uh, the, the, the Italian forces on this side and the Ethiopian forces uh, on 
the other side. And this is a symbol of, of national sovereignty. Bear in mind, this isn't a moment when uh, Africa is being sort of carved up like a great big giant cake by all of the European uh, colonial powers. And so for the black world and for African Americans, Ethiopia's sovereignty and their ability to repulse the uh, invaders of potential colonizers uh, was, uh, was a, a tremendous thing. And so images of African national sovereignty and power are tremendously inspiring for black Americans. Uh, and so the, I, I just mentioned that to really sort of complicate our image of the, of Africans and the diaspora sort of inhabiting these sort of completely different uh, you know, sort of historical and political uh, and, and cultural universes. And Ethiopia looms really large in the sort of the global black imagination because Italy tried again uh, as part of the wave of fascism, the rise of fascism in Europe. Italy invaded Ethiopia, uh, and this time they used modern armaments, uh, uh, weapons, uh, poison gas, things like that, and they were successful. And this was an outrage for the entire black world. Africans and people of African descent all over the world rallied to the cause of Ethiopia. Black Americans are sending money and volunteering to try to fight to liberate Ethiopia from uh, the Italian invaders. And here you see the Emperor Haile Selassie, who was trying to engage in international diplomacy on, his, on, on behalf of his country by going to the League of Nations and calling for you know, some kind of resolution uh, or some kind of international action to restore the sovereignty of Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, and to some extent Liberia as well, as the only independent African countries throughout the era of colonialism, which basically goes from the late 19th century until really the mid 20th century, Ethiopia and <clears throat> Liberia are proud symbols of African independence and sovereignty. So I'm going to just skip ahead and talk about another symbol of African sovereignty, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, very different from Wakanda's approach to uh, African power and sovereignty. Kwame Nkrumah uh, gains independence for his country, Ghana, in 1957. And he says the independence of Ghana is meaningless without the total liberation of the African continent. So he has a vision that is much bigger than the independence of this tiny country. He has a vision of, uh, of power that even exceeds Africa, uh, of liberation that exceeds Africa. He wants to achieve, and he wants to contribute to the struggle to achieve freedom for black people everywhere. Very different from the vision uh, of Africa's relationship to the diaspora that is presented in the film. Okay. And then, of course, a major symbol, and this, is, this will be, I guess, I'll conclude on this note. A major symbol for African Americans, this connection between the U.S. black struggle for freedom and African liberation struggles was Malcolm X. And Malcolm X went to Ghana after he left the Nation of Islam to try to figure out how to gain the political support of African heads of state for the struggles of African Americans for freedom in the United States. And here we see Malcolm X pictured with Maya Angelou, who was also in Ghana. And Malcolm made a very important statement about, and he was, he was very much concerned about shaping this relationship between African Americans and Africans. He, he didn't want African Americans to move to, to Africa physically. He felt that Africa was crucial for the foundation of African American cultural identity. And so African Americans should migrate, not physically, but spiritually, culturally, and philosophically. So it's a very different kind of identification, a very different basis for cultural identity than what we're presented with in the film, which is this fundamental alienation between Killmonger and you know, the idea of Africa. So I just wanted to briefly, I suppose, 
talk about that history as a way of having a frame of reference for thinking about these issues of African American cultural identity, African diaspora identity, and the relationship of African Americans to African peoples. So thank you. And now we're here for Professor Asif. Portuguese representative. When she entered the room with her delegation, there was only one seat. And she could see clearly that the seat was not for her, but for the Italian representative. So she had to either stand there, almost like a, a, not really an, a, invited in the room, or sit on the floor which would have put her in a very low position. So I'm referring to this because in the movie you see those young women thinking very quickly. There's a situation, what to do? And one of the uh, 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 members of her representative very quickly thought about uh, solving the problem. So she put herself, her knees and arm on the floor and uh, lifted her back and created a seat for the queen to sit to be on the same level as the <coughs> representative. So um, I think I see some of my students here. I talked about it in class today with a lot of excitement. Uh, but uh, I would like to quickly say that in a discussion that I had with uh, some African scholars in 2008, I went to Ethiopia for a meeting with the um, CODESRIA, Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa. And the discussion was around the election of the United States, a few weeks before the election. And they wanted to know what are my, perspect my perspectives and expectation and prediction. And at that time, I had uh, fairly, I could predict that uh, uh, Senator Obama would win. But I told them, but let's not misplace our expectations. He will not transform the U.S. institutions, the system. And then I also, uh, later, that same month actually, uh, one of the last uh, visits to Cornell of the late uh, Ron Walters, uh, there was that excitement in the, uh, with the election. <coughs> and after he gave his talk, always as so brilliant, during the Q&A, my own contribution was that, uh, again, um, Senator Obama as president will not change what some are hoping he will change. It's a system that has been in place for so long. He will not. So let's think of places where we can gain something for the young people. It's the idea of shattering that myth that that place is off limit to the black people. The inspiration that the young people will, will receive. And yesterday there was another discussion of a, of a documentary. Am I too African to be American? Am I too American to be African? And I, I shared some of my own experiences when we were taking our children deliberately to Africa when they were young. Uh, they were too young to realize that this African leader is not so good leader. They could see that he's a leader. The president is a black person. And that was very important for them. That, that you're not a minority everywhere. There are places where we, you are a majority. So all this will matter. So this was my comment, that this is what we need to expect from the Obama uh, coming to serve as president. And obviously, we are still in the situation. Uh, my colleague there, um, Professor uh, Rooks, recent book, on the ongoing situation about the school system. 
So, uh, still I would like to uh, share some of uh, the comments on why it's important and uh, why I feel so positive. In his commentary on uh, Black Panther uh, titled, Wakanda Matters, when a black film sparks a global movement, and here is why we, you should care. The pop culture critic, essayist, literary editor, fiction writer, and music journalist, Miles Marsh Marshall Lewis wrote, I quote, Black Panther is that black ball for the spirit. Big black excellence turning us all the way out in such a highly visible stage connects Black Panther with those earliest days of Obama optimism. That hypeness of we just overcame. Experiencing the first major black African superhero at the center of the Hollywood temp uh, tentpole uh, event feels like Inauguration Day 2009 all over again. And we hear for all of it. And I would like to quote here my own daughter, <laughs> who is my, my, uh, my inspiration, uh, Enongo. Uh, some of you know her by her stage name as Samos. Uh, someone, was, uh, someone was referring to Samos one day, and I was saying, it's my daughter, her name is Enongo. He said, no, you don't know who I'm talking about, Samos. <laughs> so it's the same person. Um, and 2016 um, um, album um, uh, entitled Pieces in Space. She has one song that is titled Black Perfect. And the lyrics in verse two uh, ends like this. I finally get a smile or the bad thought abandoned me. Mama told me, told, taught me how to be proud like the family. Had to wait until I saw that I am a work of art. I love the game, but I'm the realest kind of perfect duck. Black girls, one have a hero too. Uh, it goes on. So, that aspect of the film. The shades of color of the skin among the people of African descent and the celebration of blackness affirmed by Chala, Nakia, Oki, and more. I see that in the film. Black Panther, of course, is, is a fiction. Even if it had been based on a real life story, it would have missed some aspect, as it is simply not possible to condense in two hours an entire life journey of an individual, let alone centuries of experiences of a people across human geographies. Thus, it has limitations as we <coughs> read there had been more engagement about issues mentioned in passing. But engaging such issues would have meant that some other narratives and actions would have been left out. So necessarily, uh, it has its limitation. Also, there were scenes of violence, and I'm personally tired of warfare, no matter for what. Uh, so, the issue of is there any justifiable violence, all this uh, is part of the, the film. So this is a film, uh, a fiction, not documentary. However, I would like to recall here that there are three types of education, as my colleague mentioned, education is part of my uh, uh, academic uh, uh, specialization. This is the formal uh, education. Um, for which students, faculty, administrators, and staff converge to academic institutions such as Cornell. That's the non-formal, that is structured, but not exactly as the formal. And the informal, that's a powerful, powerful role to play as well. That impact on us, uh, defines us, 
shapes our views without even realizing that we're being shaped. So these three components of the education are there. And movies constitute a powerful non-formal and informal education instrument. Part of the potential and actual power of the movie rests on, regardless of the relevance and timeless, uh, time, timeliness of the topic, the possibility of reaching a much wider audience across the globe that even the massive open online course called MOOCs organized by academic institution cannot achieve. Thus, while being a fiction, Black Panther is a very powerful movie with a powerful education instrument uh, um, goal uh, with a pan-African and Afropolitan framework of affirmation. And here are some of the issues that I, I, I found um, that I hope we will be able to engage some. Uh, Professor Gaines has already uh, addressed. Uh, agency <coughs> and unity among uh, people of African descent. And it's uh, quite uh, um, uh, important that we are here in the Africana Center. When we say uh, Africana, which unit are you part of Africana? Uh, people tend to correct, you mean African? No, it's Africana. That A is very powerful. It means that those who conceptualize Africana as an academic unit, as an academic field, as a discipline, clearly articulated the importance of bringing together Africa and the African diaspora. Africa cannot advance while forgetting. It's, it's a representation across the globe, particularly those who came against their will, but not only them. If you read a book, they came before Columbus. African people were coming to this part of the world long before Columbus. Uh, so Africans who were forced out and those who traveled uh, freely, uh, they are very much part of the African reality today. You cannot deny that reality and advance. And as for people of African descent, including, and more importantly, those who were forced out in a particular historical context, you cannot advance by denying who you are, where you're from. So that was the philosophical motivation for inventing African studies, meaning people of Africa and the African diaspora, whatever the history. So, then what I saw in the film is that agency and unity among African people, despite the <coughs> essential issue of the collaborator within, <laughs> the invaders from outside and the collaborator within, all these were part of it. And critiquing and taking action for the stolen property of Africa. It's the, the human being who was stolen, and also the resources, the art, and stopping and preventing the pillage of African culture and material resources. It makes you think of uh, Walter Rodney, how Europe underdeveloped Africa. And you can think of Patrice Lumumba, who stated his only crime was that the resources of the Congo, one of the richest countries in the world, to the point that um, Henry Kissinger exclaimed once, it's an aberration that such a rich country could be in Africa. And as you know, there is still chaos today because that chaos made it possible to continue to um, take away the resources. When you touch your computer, your cell phone, it's likely that something inside that machine is from the Congo because it has such a wide range of minerals. So when Lumumba said the resources of the Congo should be used to advance the well-being <coughs> of the people, that's the reason why he was assassinated. So it makes you think of that as well. And then being alert about external and powerful forces uh, that aim to exploit is very visible uh, in the film, uh, global politics, 
And interestingly, the assassination at the United Nations. Uh, I have my 14th year of uh, taking students to, to the UN uh, in, uh, in, uh, um, in, in February. And when you, you, you enter in the United Nations after you pass the security co uh, control point, there's one statue that's very striking. It's the statue of a gun, but tied. It means no bullet should ever go through that gun. So it's interesting that uh, that assassination occurred in the film. It was uh, at the United Nations. But it's to signify also that when the Africans acquired their independence, they started to become part of the United Nations. <coughs> um, and then um, science and technology and African development as embedded in the education policy conceptualized in the African Union's uh, um, Agenda 2063, and specifically in the Continental Education Strategy for Africa, CESA, where science and technology loom large. It will be through science and technology that Africa will advance. Some of us have made some criticism. You don't just focus on science and technology. You have to frame it. You have to locate it in the social context, in the, in the thinking. Uh, but it, it was very clear uh, in, that, in the movie. And the glamour and pageantry is something that I really love. I'm wearing here <laughs> the, uh, you see these, uh, the kente of the Ashanti. And the jewelry I'm wearing is named Queen Coco in Cote d'Ivoire, where I'm from. We, are this, we were the same people, Ashanti, uh, before we were divided by, between the French and the British. And this was the jewelry of the time when the queen, uh, actually it was quite common to find women leaders before the colonial time. The second half of the 19th century in what is Ghana today was dominated by women. All the way to Ya Asantewa, who was the last leader. When uh, Adwa uh, occurred, the European learned the lesson. We shall never uh, allow another colonial uh, unit to reproduce what would happen in Ethiopia. But they almost had that situation in Ghana. <coughs> and what is Ghana today? When they uh, exported, sent, exiled the entire court, according to the Akan system, with a dual system of women and men drooling all the way to the top, if in a situation the male leader is absent, he had the King had died or had been incapacitated, all the power is uh, shifted to the female uh, side. So they elected a queen, Queen Ya Asanto, who was the last to be captured after they almost defeated the British, except that they brought more of the British uh, 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 troops from the other colonies. And when she was captured, then the, a picture of her holding her gun in defiance, and she was deported to the Seychelles Island, lived there for 21 years in captivity, died in captivity. So uh, this is uh, something that is very visible. Uh, race and agency uh, is another theme, and gender <coughs> that uh, Professor Gain had talked about. Uh, I'm working on a manuscript entitled Africana Women and Power, From Centrality to Marginality and the Global Forward Looking, uh, 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 Global Forward Looking, uh, uh, I'm missing something here in my own title. So it means they were <laughs> at the center really of power. What you see in the film is not just, just fiction, it's based on the reality. That dual governance system existed in the Africa. Except when the European came, they created school for chiefs' sons, not chiefs' children, eliminating women. So that's what has created the, uh, the situation we see today. And the African continent, the historic diaspora and the Afropolitanism, Ubuntu, the widening the circle. <coughs> Do we care about our specific uh, unit, such as Ghana, the Congo, or do we think of the global Africa, 
the reality, the continent and the global African reality uh, across, uh, across the globe. And uh, the youth and uh, the role of the youth is a very, very striking. Uh, Africa is not static at all. From here you would think, you, I don't even want to mention some people who have said terrible things about Africa today, but travel to Africa. You are amazed by what is happening uh, in the continent. The young people, there are still too many children who do not have access to education. Uh, too many uh, um, uh, communities where there is no proper healthcare system. However, Africa is not static and the young people are really leading uh, in those uh, areas of advancement. And I would like to finish by saying that uh, also <coughs> switching the language, the language, the language proficiency, proficiency, switching from one language to another so easily in the field, it's, it's not just fiction, it's a reality. In one conversation, among ourselves, we can switch from one language to another, back and forth, African and, and, uh, and uh, European languages. So here, I would like to mention our illustrious uh, colleague who passed away, Professor Masri, who has written about the need for Africa to recover its memory. And when Africa recovers its memory, it will realize that Africa should not be the place and had not been the place where people come to help from outside. And in fact, Africa can solve its own problem if left alone. And not only will it solve its own problem, but will create solution for the world. Africa can lead and must lead. Africa has a lot to offer. And uh, uh, we have a, a book that just came out, came out uh, there, Ubuntu, uh, that really created that framework. And finally, let me finish by uh, reading uh, something here of the, of the role of the Afropolitan. I wrote an article uh, two, published two years ago uh, um, entitled Harnessing the Empowerment Nexus of Afropolitanism and Higher Education, Purposeful Fusion for Africa's Social Progress in the 21st Century. It appeared in the Journal of African Transformation and published by CODESRIA, the Council for Social Science Development in Africa, and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. And uh, I talked about Pan-Africanism and, uh, and um, Afropolitanism. Uh, what is the difference? So I, I go through all that. But I would like some of the scene in Korea, uh, part of the, for those of you who have seen the film, uh, what happened in Korea and uh, uh, many other contexts. <coughs> Let me think of this. Let me uh, quote here uh, Tai uh, Twakli um, uh, Wosono. Some of you may know of uh, the work uh, in, in a literary area. But there was a debate about Afro Afropolitanism. And he made this contribution by defining who are the Afropolitan. And I see, remember uh, at uh, some stage, toward the end, uh, when uh, Nakia wanted to, to leave, she represents part of that Afropolitan uh, uh, community. <coughs> she lives abroad. But uh, he was begging her to stay. Uh, but in reality, the Afropolitan are those who really are not, don't belong to one space alone. So let me read this and then I will stop. So uh, I quote here, they, in parenthesis, read we, because he considered himself as a, as a part of, of, of them. Uh, we are the Afropolitans, the newest generation of Africans, immigrants, coming soon or collected already at a law firm, chem lab, jazz lounge near you. You know us by our funny blend of London fashion, New York jargon, African ethics, and academic successes. Some of us are ethnic mixes, e.g. Ghanaian, Canadian, Nigerian, Swiss, others merely cultured mutts. Afri uh, American accent, 
European affect, African ethos. Most of us are multilingual. In addition to English or a romantic or two, we understand some indigenous tongues and speak a few urban vernaculars. There is at least one place on the continent to which uh, we tie our sense of self, be it a nation state such as Ethiopia, a city such as Ibadan, or an auntie's kitchen. Then there is the G8 city, or two or three that we know like the backs of our hands, and the institutions, corporate, academic, that know us for our focus. We are Afropolitans, not citizens, but Africans of the world. And I could see that in the film as well. So let me stop here, and uh, uh, I, I hope uh, we will uh, uh, address some of those, those other aspects uh, in the film. So thank you. Because Wakanda, in many ways, represents a black utopian vision, 
right? This is a this is a sort of I mean it's, it's Afrofuturism. This is a this is a, a sort of vision of um, of, a, of a black uh, uh, utopia, and black utopian visions are always political. <laughs> this is the point I want to make. Black utopian visions are always uh, are always political. So I think that the movie, in many ways, draws on this long tradition black folks have of imagining idyllic black communities, right? And imagining communities beyond white supremacy, right? Um, and, and, and quite often, that involves imagining Africa, right? Imagining Africa as a site of sanctuary, imagining Africa as a site of deliverance, um, imagining Africa um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a safe part Right? And also this notion that the redemption of Africa in some ways is also going to signal, this is a very, very old idea, is going to signal, is going to bring about the redemption, the salvation of black people, of African descended people all around the world. Right? Very old tradition. So I think this is a deeply, a deeply political um, movie. Since it's so damn political, we might as well talk about it. Right? Uh, uh, so let me, let, me, let me very, very briefly, very, very briefly, Mention, I think, three, maybe three or four things that I think are very positive about this movie. We can talk all night about the positive things about this movie, okay? I mean, let me just put that out there. There's a lot of positive, and it's a very rich, the fact that we're having this conversation, you came out in the midst of this sort of, the, you know, sort of impending snowstorm reflects the fact that there's a lot in this movie. It's a very rich movie. Um, so three positive. Number one, obviously, just the pleasure, a <laughs> tremendous pleasure, of sort of seeing three-dimensional, complicated, uh, dignified black characters, right? Number one. Okay. Um, number two, black people's skin. Don't we have some beautiful skin? Right? It's gorgeous. I mean, it was a, it was a pageant of blackness, right? And, I mean, it's, it, you should also note, like in a, in a society that's obsessed, obsessed with light skin, there was some beautiful brown mahogany skin on this plate, right? And that, I mean, that brings us pleasure because it's so often um, denied um, and marginalized. Uh, and thirdly, um, Although I think gender in, in general is, there's a sort of complicated conversation around gender that needs to happen. Um, but I think overall, uh, African women are portrayed as, as strong, as largely uh, independent minded, rather than you know, simply as sexual objects, uh, or as appendages, or as consorts. And, and so, um, a lot of positive aspects of this film. That having been said. <laughs> Got it out of the way. I can do my professor thing. <laughs> Ruin it for everybody. Uh, I, uh, I, I thought the film was very unsatisfying as a, as a, as a pan-African vision, as a vision of pan-Africanism, right? So pan as an expression of this sort of long-standing uh, belief that African and African-descended people around the world are linked in multiple ways, culturally, uh, politically, socially, historically. Uh, and therefore must coordinate um, or cooperate in order to liberate themselves, right? Um, and, and there were many, many varieties or schools uh, or tendencies within Pan-Africanism, but if I could just sort of very crudely uh, delineate two. Um, these sort of two philosophies or tendencies within Pan-Africanism, one is a racial vision, what I call racial Pan-Africanism. And another one is what I call a, a leftist Pan-African, a left Pan-Africanism or a revolutionary Pan-Africanism. Okay, so you've got a racial Pan-Africanism and a left Pan-Africanism or a revolutionary Pan-Africanism. And I think this movie, and more specifically Killmonger, right, leaves both visions unfulfilled. So he fails to fully satisfy the racial Pan-Africanists and he fails to fully satisfy the revolutionary Pan-Africans. And in the next 90 seconds, I'm going to explain, and I'm going to wrap up so we can, we can have this very rich conversation. Okay, so racial Pan-Africanism. So racial Pan-Africanism posits racial affinity, um, racial kinship, 
as the basis of the connection between Africa and the diaspora. Okay? Um, it, it tends to be deeply <coughs> romantic, uh, romantic in its portrait of African history uh, and culture and life. So you saw that romanticism and, and that idealization. Um, and there are some ways, I should say, that, that I think Black Panther does satisfy um, uh, the yearning for a kind of a racial um, uh, Pan-Africanism, right? Um, in its idealization of African life, in its valorization of African monarchies, right? We were kings and queens, right? How many times have we heard that? We were kings and queens. We were kings and queens. Everybody apparently is descended from kings and queens. Right? What the hell kind of monarchy is this? We don't have any subjects, right? <laughs> so, so there is, but there is that sort of deeply sentimental, deeply romantic, uh, Afrocentric um, uh, yearning, and I think to some extent the, the film reflects that and fulfills it. But the thing about racial pan-Africanism is racial pan-Africanism ultimately wants at least two things: it wants um, reunion and it wants restoration. Right? It wants reunion and it wants uh, restoration. So ultimately, the emphasis is not only on imagining home, but returning home. Right? Um, and and uh, Africa um, posited as the homeland or the motherland. So, it, so you need to have that return um, uh, in order to be restored, which is to say that the children of the diaspora, the folks who've been dispersed through the context of, uh, of slavery, um, will not only be returned home, but they will be restored fundamentally, they will be restored culturally, they'll be, they will claim their inheritance, their birthright, right, in a number of different ways. Um, and so there will, be, there, will be a, there will be a successful reunion. Right? That doesn't happen, right, because we know what happens to Killmonger, it didn't work out. <laughs> it doesn't work out, so the prodigal son comes home, but then things fall apart, right. Um, to mix some of the literary references. <laughs> Some of you um, So he's unable to claim his inheritance or be restored culturally, uh, so the reunion is, is unsuccessful. All right, I got 30 seconds left. There's another vision within Pan Africanism, the radical vision or the revolutionary vision. Okay, follow me. So this is a different notion of the basic links uh, between Africa uh, and, the, and the diaspora. Revolutionary Pan Africanism believes that the critical ties do not lie in racial essence, nor necessarily in culture, right? Nor necessarily in culture. Of course, there, there are connections, but the critical connection does not lie in any racial identity, or racial essence, or racial mystical connection, um, or in culture, but rather, it finds connections in terms of our <coughs> existing political, social, and economic realities. And this existing political and social and economic realities of the masses of black people <coughs> around the world. Right? The masses, not the kings and queens, <laughs> wherever y'all may be, but us regular folk, the workers, right? The poor folks, the folks who are struggling. What kind of connections? Our connections under racial capitalism. Our connections, uh, our oppression under colonialism and imperialism. Our oppression under militarism. Our oppression under white supremacy. Right? So Killmonger, I believe, is a caricature of this radical tradition in many ways. This revolutionary pan-Africanist tradition. He's a distortion, right, of this radical uh, tradition. He's portrayed, of course, as a sociopath, right? As a sociopath. Therefore, right, one can only c conclude that any sort of global vision of liberation, of revolution that's going to connect oppressed people around the world is a demented vision. It, it, it's, it comes from a deranged person, right? It comes, in fact, from a sociopath. All right, I got 15 seconds left. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, so I, I, I see Black Panther as an opportunity, right? As a real opportunity to have a conversation. That's why I'm so excited. And, I, and I, you know, I, I, I'm not very good on Facebook, on Facebook and social media, but I've been trying to get into conversation on social media. I've been, you know, I probably got unfriended 
Except for times where I'm that guy. I mean, because I, this is a critical opportunity not only to discuss the film, but what I really believe to reignite our imagination, our global imagination, our diasporic imagination. Um, and ultimately, I, I hope and believe our radical uh, imagination. To have a conversation about modes of internationalism. And more importantly, watch this, more importantly, to have a conversation about solidarity. Right? Solidarity. Solidarity does not mean sameness. It doesn't mean Africans on the continent and African descended people throughout the diaspora, um, black folk here and there, right? As a distinguished scholar once said, are the same culturally, politically, economically, otherwise, right? What it does mean is that if we understand our material circumstances, the political economy of, of white supremacy, the political economies of imperialism, right, of militarism, of all of the global structures that oppress us, we will be able to identify common principles and common ground and act on the basis of mutuality and reciprocity, right? So in the end, you know what, my, my, the part of the movie I, I hate the most, and I, and I love, I, remember I said, I started off the positive, is the end when Wakanda comes to Oakland. <laughs> they come to Oakland and what do they do? What do they do with all that vibranium? Remember, as we have this conversation that we're about to launch into, I, keep in mind vibranium. Vibranium is at the center of this conversation. What do they, when they bring their vibranium to Oakland, what do they do? They build an a, a outreach center, right? They build an outreach center in Oakland. Um, what is that? That's noblesse oblige. Right? That's uplift. That's what you do when you feel sorry for somebody. Isn't it? You build them an outreach center. That's not solidarity. What kind of don't need nothing from Oakland? But here's the thing. Let's remember. What kind of is fictional? Right? Oakland is real. Oakland has a radical tradition. Oakland has a revolutionary tradition. Right? Going back to the Black Panthers. Right? And it has a tradition forged by African Americans in the context of our struggle, our long struggle here in exile, right? that we develop our, through our resilience, through our, through our, through our uh, persistence, through our, our yearning for freedom, that we develop this revolutionary vision. What kind of ain't got no revolutionary vision? Because they were never colonized. <laughs> right? Right? It was all good. They were, they were, they had their little gated community. That's the bourgeoisie, right? So I think that so in closing, this is our opportunity to have a real conversation, not only about pan-Africanism, but about radical internationalism, about international solidarities. And that means rediscovering an Africa that is real, not imagined. That's real, not imagined. An Africa that exists today, right? That has been penetrated by US imperialism and militarism, absolutely penetrated, right? And is suffering, the masses, the working people of Africa are suffering in the same way that the working people of the United States um, and other parts of the West are suffering. And we need to have a conversation about solidarity based on mutuality rather than myth. of the Afropolitan as represented in the film, uh, which, which is really interesting when you think about this notion of Pan-African solidarity. Uh, the, the, uh, the, character's name again. Uh, the character played by Lupita Nyong'o. Thank you. Yes. She uh, has this global vision. 
She has this vision of solidarity. She wants to intervene on behalf of black people in distress on the African continent, but no doubt elsewhere. She is fluent in crossing sort of linguistic and cultural boundaries. And so she's a very exemplary figure for, if you want to think in terms of Afrofuturism. Um, Professor Rickford, I think, uh, is emphasizing the theme of solidarity and how the, the film falls short of historical and contemporary political ideals of solidarity. Uh, in a sense, you could say that Frantz Fanon uh, sort of predicted the, the uh, narrative of Wakanda as uh, you know, sort of standing in for the bourgeois nationalism of African uh, post-independent elites who, uh, who really betray the, the kind of uh, sort of broader political and social aspirations for a better life of the African masses that they were hoping to achieve through political independence. Um, I'm going to just throw out a question to the, to the audience. Why does, if Wakanda is so technologically advanced and sitting on all of this vibrating, why do, does the country conduct its transition of power through a fight where you have two black, and, and you know, I think this is partly, in, in a lot of ways the film reverses or, 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 or inverts traditional assumptions about Africa and the world, the relationship of Africa to African Americans. Uh, as, as Professor Rickford said, you have Wakanda coming to Oakland and you know, you know, sharing their largesse, which is kind of a reversal of the whole history of Pan-Africanism in which African Americans saw themselves as the redeemers of, of Africa. But what does it mean when every time there's a challenge, there, there's a, a sort of a, a, a transition to Wakanda rule? Uh, it has to be done through uh, a sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat, to the death. And it reminded me of the whole history of racism and segregation in Jim Crow, where uh, white Americans would gain pleasure and entertainment uh, by watching two black men blindfolded fight it out in a battle royal. So, I think this, I think the film does a lot of things that really sort of challenge uh, our assumptions about Africa, our, our norms in terms of blackness and beauty and power. But I really think that at a deeper level, there are some very insidious uh, messages and representations that are coming through the film. And I, I offer that, you know, why, for all of its technological prowess and sophistication, uh, do Wakandans have to duke it out for you know, legitimacy for power? I mean, I think Queen, Queen Zega established political norms for the trans for, for transition of, of regimes in the 17th century. So, so why do we have this really backward representation of power and uh, rule, rulership and legitimacy in this film? That's just something to throw out. And, and uh, if anyone has, uh, would like to take it from here and continue the conversation, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're watching your, your, for your uh, hands to be raised. And there's a microphone in the center so that we can all hear each other. I think um, both presentations raised some very crucial questions. However, in looking at the film, I think we have to be very careful. One, the film is making reference to specific periods in African history, as well as African American reality. However, one of the things I think that we have to keep in mind is to say there are different political traditions. One that you speak to Professor Bickford is the tradition of black nationalism and pan-Africanism. And you also speak to the question of socialism and pan-Africanism. There are various ways in which people interpret those realities. If you look at the end of the movie, very specifically, 
specifically the question is, and put throughout the movie, obviously you're right. You're raising the question of addressing the question of self-esteem of African American people in relation to the African diaspora, specifically continental Africa. I would raise this question and I want you to elaborate further, right, based on your knowledge of Pan-Africanism and Black nationalism. Can we say that all black masters and pan-Africans have a very romantic view of Africa and think that just on the basis of skin color alone that we can liberate Africa? Specifically, case in point, the apartheid movement. Would South Africa be free if black nationalists and pan-Africans in America just looked at the question of skin color alone? The man on the wall behind us, right? Was he what? Just looking on the basis of race and not looking at learning and involving and looking at the question of class and beginning to look at the question of gender? Speak to that, please. And because I think the view that you present of black nationalism is very distorted. There are differences, and it goes back to the conflict between the Panthers and us. I would, I would love to talk about that, but I. Perhaps we should get some more uh, responses from the audience and uh, allow people to riff off of that or to raise further questions and then maybe we can sort of um, have the dialogue that way. But I think, I, I think that we've been urged to have folks come up to the microphone, I think for recording purposes. I, um, think, I think for that and for so we can all hear each other. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, my name is Aaron Matthews. I'm class of 97, and um, I came up here just to say thank you um, from SEBA for everybody participating and coming together to go to the movies. It was a really, it was a, a super effort by everybody coast to coast, and I've been recording up for 25 years, and thank you, because it was just an idea we ran with, and that we ran hard, and in terms of solidarity, we were able to reach people that we were never able to reach to get them to go see this movie. And we started at the alumni meeting, and we ran with it, and people came together. They came together at 14 theaters, and that solidarity, we saw it. We saw it. It was like, through time and space, we can't bring everybody back to Cornell until reunion, but we can get them to this movie at that time. And People saw that, and that solidarity of us in Africana, us in Uj, us in Cornell, everything we went through, people activated. So there is a solidarity in this movie, because that fantasy, each little group over the course of time had to imagine that. And when this came about, it activated. So it, it, it's not transparent, it's intrinsic, and those people, it was, it, was, it was spiritual, it was cultural. People, we don't have to meet different black people, Spanish people, Chinese people, Asian people at Cornell. We have that one super person from that community. One, maybe two. But together, we all work together while we're here at Cornell, and that doesn't happen in the world. But for them to come together for this movie, that was super by itself. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of you for participating in that. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to just say was that I'm from Harlem, so we've been talking about this. We've been talking about this hard for days, and so many people needed those images to heal, to feel like they were a part of mainstream. And there may never be another Black Panther movie. So this is so historic for all of us to be a part of it, is that we're all connected from time, through time and space. That's, that's the only way I could even imagine it. It's, it just, it's unimaginable. And that creates the start of those dreams that you guys taught here in Africana. We don't, we really, you know, you teach us a lot of stuff. And I've been in the Corner, I'm 25 years. I mean, some of it, I just don't know how to work it. But this time, we had a shot. And we all took it, and we took it together. So. I just want to say thank you for that. I want to say thank you for this presentation. And um, 
you know, just keep, you know, giving us these, these thought provocative things so that we can recreate it in the real world. It's not as easy as said and done, but at here at Cornell, at least we get the tools to try to put it together when we get out in the real world. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think your, your comment reminds us that of, the, of the, the impact of this moment that exceeds the content of the film, and it becomes a catalyst for conversations and a catalyst for seeking knowledge that is rooted in, in reality, so that we don't have to have these sort of fantasy heroes of T'Challa uh, or the other characters. We can think about you know, sort of real life action heroes, like Harriet Tubman, right? Or, you know, people who, who did really extraordinary things. Uh, and, uh, and obviously, we're not victorious. People like uh, Patrice Lumumba, who, I, I, I think it's a great analogy between Wakanda and the mineral-rich Congo. And that was really why Lumumba uh, had to be neutralized, had to be removed, had to be assessed because he was willing to use that wealth uh, not only you know, for the benefit of people in Congo, but towards a larger politics of Pan-African solidarity. But I'm sorry, you want to... But I was saying that to some people, this was the spark, this was the seed. This was the seed for them to go search and find that information. Because some of that information, if you didn't come through Africana or that type of program, you wouldn't run into any professors like you or a Dr. Turner that would tell you to go look for it. Right. And now, this is the age of information. So you can all pull out your phone and just go black and then go sort and do all this thing. You know, I'm not futuristic like that. But I got the phone, <laughs> but I, I can't do it like the kids do it. And they're throwing up stuff all over the world. So, you know, now that we have it, we can build them. So thank you. Thank you. Right, I wanted to clarify what I said, actually, Russell kind of truncated it. I think that black people took an emotional blow with the Trump statement. Of course, the production, there have been a production before. So people who don't even do any African um, studies or uh, study or think through any of these issues, see the film, and when I went, they were wearing African clothing. Um, and people are still Wakanda out. So there's a sense in which it kind of helped. Right. It has helped a kind of reclamation and this prompted. To me, the power of text is what, is what I find fascinating, that people are dressed from African couture to scarves to everything when they go to see the film. Um, at least that was my experience initially when it, that weekend when it came out. Um, and then, of course, the sororities on a region where the people took children, and it was amazing. So I think it was a kind of reaffirmation of a certain kind of way. Um, but, Russell, you talked about two kinds of Pan-Africanism, but the cultural Pan-Africanism, or the cultural nationalism aspects, I think, were really writ large in the film as well. Maybe you want to talk about that. But I was also fascinated by, um, I don't like to use Kelly Marga, because there's another name in Okay. He says in the end, throw me in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped off the slave ships because they knew death was better than bondage. It was like a moment of clarity when he was looking out at what could have been. And I wondered if you all would address that point because it is full of all kinds of meanings that the film doesn't really address. Once it, you know, it moves through that myth that it created and then of course the reality and the ending for me was just very troubling too, because it becomes our mighty three buildings for the center. And also, um, in spite of the fact that it works, women very interestingly through the military women and so on, um, Lupita starts off with a vision of, that is very transformative, and maybe Andrew might address this. But by the end, she fits back into sort of nuclear um, heterosexual paradigm, as the logic of romantic love and marrying the prince or the king, or whatever. So essentially. She, she begins in a very revolutionary place with Boko Haram rescuing and all of that and then moves to her sort of buying into a very limited version of what that could be and then she's going to be in charge of something in the Alfred Center or something like that. So you so could comment on that. We were in the ocean with my ancestors that jumped off the slave ships because they knew what death was better than bondage and what it, how it resonates, I'll be grateful. If I could just say very briefly, 
In that scene in which uh, T'Challa takes Killmonger to look at his last sunset, throughout that whole scene, I'm thinking, kind of hoping, why is not he save Killmonger? He showed mercy to the African, uh, the rival African chieftain in the, in the challenge. And then the CIA guy, he, he's got a little hunk of, uh, of, of medicinal vibranium to pop into the guy's wound. So I'm thinking, <laughs> he's, he's, shown, he's shown some mercy. Why not, you know, save Killmonger? I mean, if anything, it would be good for the sequel, right? <laughs> and there's a logic to that. I have a quick related question, too. Um, also about uh, a comment that Professor Rickford made um, how um, Ninjagwa or Killmonger, Michael B. Jordan, you know, whatever we're calling him, um, is sort of this, uh, he's sort of a caricature of an activist. And I'm, I'm so interested in that because you see that a lot in, in media, particularly on police dramas on TV where the activists are like very shallow and angry and ridiculous. And I, I, I was curious about what, what you thought about that. Not, that is not necessarily why that happens, but what is, what is the work? You know, what is that doing of, of making these activists look very ridiculous and shallow in media? Well, I, I, I want to know what, uh, if, if there are folks in the audience that, um, that, that, that want to respond to that. I, I, I definitely have some thoughts on that. And Brother Ken, I ain't forgot about your question, brother. We gonna, we gonna rumble now. <laughs> I didn't forget about you. Don't forget. <laughs> they, uh, this oh, no, no, we're not gonna forget about Bishop. We're gonna talk about Bishop. But, uh, but, but that's a good question, though, this question of um, uh, Killmonger as a caricature of activism. But I got a lot to say about that, but I want to more people in the audience to Oh, um, for me, I sort of felt that, um, like, I did see the sort of, like, sociopathic, like, nature that you were talking about during, with, um, Killmonger, but for me, I sort of felt that a lot of the times when he was talking about, like, when, like, when he actually, like, usurps, um, T'Challa and he says that, like, he wants to, um, like, arm the people, arm people all over the world so that they can sort of, like, liberate themselves, I sort of felt, like, when he does like sort of get into his revolutionary speech, like that was when to me he seemed the most sane. Because there were like other moments in the movie where he like seems clearly like deranged and we like don't know really what his motives are. But like in terms of him being like this caricature of like a revolutionary, I sort of felt like he wasn't at like he wasn't as much of a caricature because to me I sort of felt like he was one of the characters I could relate to most throughout the film because most of the black characters, well, all of the black characters in the film are like are Wakandan, and he, him, though he is Wakandan, he was raised in America, and he like lived out in like, <coughs> sorry, and he like lived in Oakland, and he like had a, um, he had a absent father figure because his father was dead. Like he, like you sort of did see why he had this anger, not only like at Wakanda itself because it like part of the reason that, like, it was part of the reason that his father was taken away from him. But just, like, also sort of, like, he sees that all these people here are living such glorious lives, and, like, he has, like, personally experienced what people, what other people who look like that are experiencing, like, pain and such. So, yeah. Um. Uh, like you, uh, uh, Professor Rickford, I, I have a, a lot of complex feelings about the film because it was um, uh, sort of beautifully made, you know, with the characters and so on. But um, there are, there are, and, and it's a mythic film, obviously. Um, but. There are a number of things that uh, really disturb me in terms of the symbolism involved, and you mentioned some of them. And one of them, obviously, is the whole notion of vibranium as this amazing resource that empowered the nation of Wakanda, the people of Wakanda. 
And then when you contrast that with the fact that you know uh, Africa is probably the world's uh, richest continent in terms of resources, but all its resources, whether it's Nigerian oil or South African diamonds, um, you know lumber, etc., um, continues to be exploited um, in according to global capitalism, often to the enrichment of powers like what the CIA agent represented. Mm -hmm. And I found that his character particularly and how he was portrayed disturbing because he ended up being an ally mm -hmm. in this um, in defense of Wakanda when in fact the CIA has been responsible for uh, the assassination of Lumumba mm -hmm. and um, the undermining of <coughs> And American militarism uh, right now in the Africa calm is, is I think, is, is devastating to Africa. So Google that, Africa. Google that. Yeah. So so um, so that that was one feature in the film that I think needs to be addressed uh, historically. Uh, um, and the other thing that um, well, you spoke to it I think very eloquently was the the ideological conflict that is represented by the Oakland-born um, son of the Black Panther, supposedly, or at least the king, the first Wakanda king, or the brother. And, um, and well, I think he spoke to it, but I found that wedge in the film, you know, portraying this, um, this conflict between the mission or the goals of Wakanda and the the um, the undermining of Wakanda by Killmonger in order to uh, promote this idea that Africa can use its resource to um, support uh, people, African people around the world. Why must that necessarily be? Mutually exclusive. Anyway, um, I just wanted to voice those. I have a lot of other things, but I'll pass it on. Uh, thank you for your presentations. I actually wanted to follow up on the question at the back, so maybe we can uh, talk to both of them together. Um, many of the images that were flashed today, uh, you talk about the different kind of ideologies in Pan Africanism. I'm myself deeply inspired by. W.E.B. Du Bois on Pan-Africanism who said that uh, Pan-Africa must unite with Pan-Asia to uh, fight against Europe. Kwame Nkrumah was flashed there said in his book on neocolonialism that Asia and Africa have to come together and must unite with Latin America. Founder of the real Black Panther Party, U.E.B. Newton said that his ideology was a revolutionary intercommunalism. And so all three of these of course are against imperialism, that is the ideology that unites them, anti-imperialism. And I guess my question was, why uh, has that question disappeared in the horizon, especially right now when, say, in 2014, President Barack Obama dropped a bomb on Libya, which has devastated Libya, which is a country in Africa. Um, why has that question disappeared, and how does the movie uh, relate to that, the question of pan africanism related to that? Yeah, well, so, okay. Um, so, to answer your question, or what you said, I think uh, Killmonger wanted death or the world more than anything else because he realized that if he were to take over the world, like he would have to, you know, maybe die in the process. So, um, what do you call it? Um, at that point, when he lost to the king, I feel that uh, he had so much pain that you know the loss was that that little bit over that just made him want to die. You know, I think you know it would kill so many people. Yeah, each time that you're killing somebody, like you're in, it's like a, it's, I don't know, he's pretty, I'm sure he's pretty confident, but you know, it's a coin top. No, 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 not a lot. So, you know, I, I think he's, he was, he had done too much, he had, he had too much pain, so he just he wanted to die. Uh, that's, uh, I, yeah, um, and another thing, um, I found it interesting that, let's see, so in the UN meeting, Wakanda was, they, they headed the meeting. Do you guys notice that? Yet, 
when trying, you know, transforming the new world, um, the way that they were helping the people in Oakland was kind of interesting. In that it, it was not recent. I mean, I think there are better ways to help people, right? So that's all I'm saying. I, because it, like, yeah, it's helping people, but it's helping people in in the way that we know it in, in the world that we live in. And you know, how helpful is that? So that's, that's all. I'm Can I just say something really quickly about the identification with Killmonger that I think has been shown in you know some audiences, particularly black audiences. Actually, you know, I don't know if that was the point that, that you raised. His character seems to be very um, mixed. On the one hand, he's a killer, he's a sociopath. But on the other hand, there are these moments, these flashes of black consciousness and black solidarity. In that statement, you know, that, that Carol referenced, when he, when he, uh, he says, I, 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 I'd rather be dead than, than continue to live in bondage. And, you know, he's just channeling something that's sort of deep within the African American cultural historical experience. Before, you know, before uh, I, I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave, and go home to my Lord and be free. And and so, and there are those moments again when he talks about a kind of a political solidarity. Obviously, it's going to be achieved by the use of force, but you know, these are um, political ideals that have a resonance with black audiences. So, you know, he's a very, very complicated character, and uh, I think that explains why there's this kind of sympathy for him, and, and not as much sympathy, shall we say, for your child. Yeah, I, I want to add to add. I don't yes, know. Yes, please. You, yeah. Um, this, the Pan African, the revolutionary, the cultural, uh, I just, the paper I submitted to for our book on uh, Professor Edmondson. Uh, the, the conference papers. Uh, I deal with uh, the African students and Pan Africanism. By the time of independence, the, many of the African leaders had already been uh, co opted. And so the, the students who were still fighting in that. Uh, 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 framework of not only liberating the African people, but liberating all the people of, of who are oppressed across the globe. They had to fight. You know, I, I, I spent only one year uh, as an undergraduate in my own country, but I had the notorious experience of uh, going to a military camp for our demand of African, respecting African uh, uh, people, when the uh, Guinea-Bissau, uh, all the former British, <coughs> Portuguese colonies, were still fighting for their independence. And Portugal uh, targeted Guinea as a frontline state, the same way the apartheid system targeted Zambia and all those countries as frontline state and harassed them, bombed them. And so invented, and we, the student, demanded that the government issue a statement against Portugal for having invented even a square mile uh, or an independent African country. The government refused. And that's what led to an escalation, and eventually we found ourselves in the military camp. So we were fighting systems that had been co-opted by the uh, global capitalist uh, 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 control. Uh, Lumumba had died uh, by that time. Nkrumah was overthrown in 1966. He was going to China. He's going to China, wants to contribute to the uh, search for solution for Vietnam. Because the idea of the Afro-Asian solidarity embedded in the Bandung Conference of 1956 was still very real. And in that, uh, that uh, Bandung um, uh, decision between the uh, Africans and the Asians, they didn't want to only free the Asian countries that were 
colonized or the one that had been freed uh, uh, you know, in terms of flags and national anthem, but real uh, uh, liberation. But they had to liberate the entire planet, almost like in the line of the 1917 uh, Russian Revolution, that we have this step and we go to the next. Well, he was going to China to contribute to searching a solution for the world. And when by the time he arrived, he had been overthrown. So that continued. Uh, it was not reflected in the film. And again, that's my own uh, sense of when in a film, even if it had been a documentary, you had to make choices. And what is the significance of the choices? When I saw first Oakland, my first reaction was Oakland, the Oakland I was thinking of. Yes. And, and, and so my, yes, my disappointment was that it was not reflected in the film. But had it been reflected, would the film, have been, would it have been done? That's a question we need to ask. Some of the constraints um, that those who are in a, in a real leadership position, politician, some of the constraints they face. And when you make certain choices, you pay a price. Lumumba was told not to give that speech. He gave two speeches that he gave. The second one was, um, the situation is more serious than you think. Let us forget what divided us and come together. What happened? It was with, uh, with Mobutu mm -hmm. that he was assassinated. Mm -hmm. And right after Zinga, there was another African leader, a young woman in her 20s, Dana Beatrice, in the same area who was appalled to see how the societies were being destroyed by the transatlantic enslavement. People who were captured, who ran away but couldn't go back home, wandering. She decided to do something about it. She was in her early 20s. She formed an army. She re 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 uh, reformed the capital city, <coughs> the, uh, the, the empire, South Salvador. But the Portuguese saw in her such an impediment to their project that they arranged, once again, with an internal the quintessential uh, collaborator from within. So she was put to death on a stake with a baby in her hand. I don't know how you burn ashes, but the next day they came back to burn the ashes again to make sure that she was really God. There are so many examples. So many examples. Nehanda, in the contemporary Zimbabwe, she was put to death the year of the Adwa battle because she organized her political leadership while had a religious component. She thought first the missionaries and she were working for the same uh, religious goal. When she realized that it was different, she organized her people. And what happened was that she found herself and So there are so many examples of this all the way from there. More recently, Winnie Mandela. Winnie Mandela. Well, what happened to her? It's not that an organization she was connected to, uh, there was a death of a young person, uh, she didn't order them to kill, but one person died. I'm not saying that it doesn't matter. How could she be discredited? When the clerk became president, the ones who were the architect of the apartheid were simply because Winnie Mandela didn't want any negotiation. Like Kojo first in Jamaica, Kojo wanted a, 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 a negotiation. Uh, Nani said no. Like in Ethiopia, Menelik wanted to negotiate with the Italian. It was the Empress who said absolutely not. You do not negotiate with freedom. It happens again and again and again, all the way to the contemporary period. So it is real that radical Pan-Africanist perspective 
but you have to accept to pay the price. Mm -hmm. And so many, many students who, who, who disappeared in the 1960s. Uh, it's, it's a reality. Uh, but, uh, okay, so here are some comments. We have another uh, Hi, first of all, I'd just thank the three of you for being here and um, presenting, um, allowing us this opportunity to have this question. Um, I don't know how relevant what I was going to say is anymore, however, I'll, I'll go with it. Um, so I think, first of all, I'm not a Marvel fan, but I think it's important to uh, distinguish that this is a Marvel character versus being about the Black Panthers. Unless I missed that and I'm totally wrong, then my bad. Um, so, but saying that um, in the very beginning, you will end up with um, the fighting scene. And when I first saw that being South African, to me, it reminded me of Zulu stick fighting. So I think there is that history of violence, if you will, um, in challenging somebody. So to not negate it, to say, oh, we had to start off with something very violent. Um, but if you notice, it was also only amongst those who were of royal blood who were allowed to challenge. So um, just to kind of put that out there. Um, also, like the sister in the back here mentioned about Killmonger being an activist, and I don't feel he was an activist in any way. Um, he was a product of his environment, and he was trained then by um, the powers that be, I believe the CIA, to be a killing force. And then he also was a traitor to his own people. So that's not activism. Activism is when you're trying to help people out in a way that is beneficial for all involved. And what is it, the vibranium? He's the one who literally sold vibranium to a group of people who were looking to destroy other people. They had no good intentions. So he wasn't an activist. Um, however, at the very end of the movie, it would have been nice, um, being that he grew up as an African-American, that in order to rec there's a lot of um, tension between Africans and African-Americans that have been either raised or born on the soil that it would have been nice at the end because you saw he had an epiphany. He saw, wow, you know what, I didn't realize what I was really doing, how destructive it could be, but I wanted to say that there's people who are suffering and how selfish of me to not open it up. They could have taken that moment to say, let's use this as a heart-changing moment to say, wow, you know what, yeah, I've been bitter. I've been angry. This is what's been happening historically to my people. Yeah, you were in a position, you had power, but wow, look at that. If we work together and solidified that African and African-American connection, that would have been more powerful. And I do appreciate the statement, I would rather be dead than live in chains. However, that didn't have to be his reality. You know, he didn't have to be in bondage after that because of that forgiving moments that the king of T'Challa had, that we saw he had um, forgiveness that was within him, and I think his people would have recog uh, recognized that as the lost son as well. So just those few points, and also I really appreciate the fact that they did portray um, a strong female presence uh, with female warriors, because historically there are many groups uh, whether they're Amazons or African groups of women warriors. And again, there's your Google moment to really look into more of it. So thank you. Hi, um, I think maybe quickly just to follow up on your point, I also really enjoy the depiction of women as strong and as being as leaders. And I believe as one of the points that was made earlier, pre-colonial Africa had that. And I was really glad they represented that. And I instantly thought of Yat Santwa, who was also brought up um, in the conversation. Um, so I was recently talking to a friend about this film, um, and he wrote an article for Blavity.com, um, however you pronounce that, that website. And one of the questions that we were thinking of, or, or something that um, maybe unsettled us a bit, was the kind of um, hodgepodge of Africa in the Wakandan film. Um, and of course, it's an Afrofuturist film, and that's a usual characteristic of Afrofuturist text. Um, but for example, the Bobo Ashantis in the beginning of the film, they said they were from Ghana, when in fact, I, if someone can correct me if I'm wrong, they're Rastafarians. They're not actually located in Ghana. Um, so was that, there was that sort of thing. Um, another one was like when um, the Black Panther went to the spiritual realm, 
and then the father is is there in the spiritual realm and he's wearing those Adinkara symbols on this like mourning cloth, which are also situated in, in Ghana. Um, but then Wakanda itself is East African, according to the like the myth of the film. And then somebody told me, I don't know how true this is, so someone else may know, the accents were based off of South African accents. So this sort of hodgepodge of Africa um, into this one you know, nation. So one of the answers that I was thinking of for myself is, is Wakanda supposed to be representative of Africa as a whole? Um, and, and that's sort of a, a question. The other one was, is it just supposed to be a representation of the sort of pan-African cultural um, cross-fertilization that we see in real life all the time, where you have um, uh, music, um, beats, and things like that kind of permeating across the black diaspora. So those were things I was thinking of, but I was wondering if someone else could speak on this sort of, um, what does it mean for black Americans to be looking at this hodgepodge of Africa, and then how does that kind of dictate how we view the continent? Um, and does that do anything good or bad or negative to our views of the continent? Um, I think it's great that people were running to the African stores, running to African seamstresses, and you know, buying um, <laughs> African clothing. I think that's great. Um, and I think that's wonderful, and I think that's a great way to kind of know a little bit more about um, the continent, but I'm still concerned to some extent about how does that then dictate and kind of, um, how does the film dictate and kind of control our views of the continent? Because the person I was speaking to is a Ghanaian, I'm a Ghanaian, so maybe our views are skewed in that sort of way. So I wanted to get other perspectives on that as well. If I can speak to that really quickly, the film does what many films before it have done in homogenizing Africa and uh, sort of erasing the diversity of <coughs> But another way to look at that might be to look at the cast of the film and how the cast talks about their participation in this film. It's truly a pan-African cast. There are, there are African actors. There are actors from African American, West Indian. And, and when we think about the audience, the actors are a really important audience. And we just heard, I mean, uh, what's his name? Uh, the, the lead guy who played Chow, the action. Chow. Yeah, he basically said that the way he interpreted his role as the child of this African, you know, ruler was that he was the villain. He imagined that T'Challa was the villain because he was hoarding the, the wealth and resources of T'Challa. He was an elitist, uh, and, uh, and and he was. And, and, and Bozeman actually said that he understood why Killmonger was a sympathetic character because a lot of the things that are thought and said by Killmonger are things that he had thought and said, you know, growing up as a black man in America. So what, that, that complexity that I think you're looking for that is not represented in Africa might come through the reflections on that experience by this truly pan-African cast that is which is really the, the strong suit movie. It, it makes a lot of really mentality stuff <coughs> pleasurable because they're so passive, they're so outstanding. But I think that'll be a really interesting thing to talk to, to, to follow how these actors from throughout the black world themselves interpret their role in the movie and how they saw their character and how they how they see the um, the reception. May I just quickly say that uh, uh, that's, that's an aspect I personally enjoy. To see a scene where you see the Kinti, the Adindra, and suddenly a Bamana song comes. <laughs> it seems so not real, but at the same time, it reflects a certain dynamism in the African uh, society today. You travel to Southern Africa, you see West Africa there. As a result of migration, the way some people dress, the braids, things that were located specifically in West Africa, you find them in different parts of the continent. So that's why uh, I said earlier that things are changing. Africa is not um, 
does not reflect that um, description. Um, what is his name again? Conrad or something. Yes. That, uh, that, that continent uh, that is static, that's not a reflection of the reality. African people have been crisscrossing <coughs> cultures that are shared, that go and come back uh, in different ways. So I think it is, it is not just uh, a, a, an imagination, it's also a reflection of the contemporary reality in Africa. That what happened in a particular context, you can find it elsewhere as a result of contemporary migration and deliberate decision. If you see, uh, this is um, uh, um, the, the recent uh, president of the African Union, uh, Blamini Zuma. She was always dressing like a West African. When you see her, you will mistake her for someone from West Africa. She's from South Africa. It is a statement. A statement about uh, African and embracing the entire African continent. Uh, the meaning of the Kente that we see here in, the, uh, you know, in our own uh, reality here. It's a very deliberate decision and a reflection. So it's not just fiction in the film, it reflects the dynamics of the African context. So it's almost, uh, it's almost uh, there's a deception out there. As, uh, so maybe we should, there are a couple, yeah, maybe we should continue the conversation outside. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your reactions.